Welcome in everybody to the flagship podcast. I am Chip Brown of Horns 24-7, joined as always by our fearless leader, the managing editor of Horns 24-7, the one and only Taylor Estes. Taylor, it is Monday, it's Black Monday. Black Monday, yeah, coming out of that loss to Kansas and uh, seems like the blows just keep coming for Texas right now, Chip. Yeah, I mean, it's bad enough you're uh, in a five-game losing streak punctuated by one of the worst home losses in school history to previously one win Kansas who had not won a Big 12 conference game on the road since 2008, but you now know you lost your star running back, Bijan Robinson, to a dislocated left elbow and your starting corner, Josh Thompson, to a fractured fibula they are done for the season and Jonathan Brooks uh, the freshman running back uh, who I'm told has a separated shoulder um, you know maybe maybe out as well uh, going into this game against West Virginia on the road this week Uh, and Jonathan Brooks is talented he he had some carries in the Kansas game looked good as usual and that would leave Roshan Johnson with turf toe and Keelan Robinson coming off of COVID-19 contact tracing. He was held out of the Kansas game as your, your two running backs before you get into uh, Gabe Watson um, and guys who haven't seen a carry all year. So yeah, uh, not ideal when you need two wins too. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is, this is uh disturbing news for a team that's you know the fans are looking at this football team and saying what on earth is going on in that locker room and they have every right to ask that question because when you don't know what you're getting from week to week uh, from your football team and steve sarkeesian even mentioned it you know the defense plays great for a half against iowa state uh, and then finally gives out because the offense was terrible uh, and then both the offense and defense were terrible uh, in the first half against Kansas. Uh, the offense picked it up, scored a bunch of points. The defense was pretty much um, off all night. But you don't know what you're getting um, from week to week, and the answers are not coming. Today, Steve Sarkeesian hinted at a complete roster overhaul, saying, you know, he could have a recruiting class of 33. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this is the same. Remember, five weeks ago, Steve Sarkeesian was saying that he hoped Texas would see Oklahoma again in the Big 12 title game. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we're talking about this locker room being so toxic that maybe it's going to require a recruiting class of 33 in a complete overhaul of the roster, Taylor. It's it's gotten away from Steve Sarkeesian and this coaching staff, that's for sure. And and now it's wait till next year. Yeah. Well, and I mean, when when Steve Sarkeesian did say that after the Oklahoma game, it was a justified statement. It wasn't some statement that anybody heard him say and said, oh, sure you will. Like everyone thought like there could be a rematch in the Big 12 title game. That just goes to show how much drop off has happened since then, Chip. And honestly, I think when you really look at the overall um, picture of Texas football and what was left on the roster that Steve Sarkeesian and his staff took over and what has happened since they have taken over. Um, you know, I, I really think that it, a roster overhaul may be the best thing that could happen to this Texas football program because there's clearly issues behind closed doors. Everybody knows it. I mean, shoot the Bo Davis video. We we haven't even really talked about that because that was leaked after we recorded um, last week's Monday show. But You know, that that right there was a perfect picture, perfect example of the amount of toxic players. And I think a lot of, um, you know, people that are questioning the direction of the program inside the locker room, you can't do that. If you're questioning the direction of the program, you're questioning the direction of the coaches or anything like that. That type of 
that type of mentality is a cancer in a locker room because it only can spread really. And, um, you know, that, that ultimately can hurt recruiting. It could hurt, you know, um, players that may not be fully bought in, but believe in the staff, it could make them doubt what's going on. Um, and, you know, I think that's something that the sooner that Steve Sarkeesian gets those guys out of the locker room, the better for the future of Texas football. So I don't necessarily think he was wrong in hitting at it. And I think that's probably what's needed um, for him to really, truly take control and change the direction of this Texas football program. Well, it's, um, it's, it's confounding because it each week it's been a different situation. Um, and now, now all the players are getting painted with, man, it's time for you to go. I mean, obviously yeah. the coaches have to determine who they, they value in terms of who's bought in, who's moving with them. Um, and obviously, you know, guys like Bijan Robinson, uh, who's a sophomore, has one more year of college, uh, <laughs> um, eligibility left before he becomes eligible for the NFL draft. I mean, those are obvious, but you know, the quarterback position, uh, Steve Sarkeesian's rotating quarterbacks, uh, 10 games into the season and, and you know, the, the evidence is overwhelming, uh, in favor of Casey Thompson from a production standpoint. And yet Steve Sarkeesian has barely endorsed the kid as his starting quarterback. Well, he, he did address it today. Um, cause he, he did want to clear it up. He was asked why Casey was benched for Hudson card against Kansas. And he, clarified saying that that was the plan all along. And he thought that he had told the media the plan was to have Hudson Card come in. I think what was after two series of uh, Casey Thompson in the first quarter against Kansas, he said that was a plan all along, but he did say that Casey is the starter moving forward. It wasn't a, you know, very um, bold, you know, uh, I guess support that he said, but he did say, you know, that Casey Thompson is the starter this weekend moving forward. So he has, but he hasn't done it in a way that I think some people are expecting a coach to be so solidified in who they're starting quarterback after 10 games on the season. He didn't say it in a way that most coaches probably would if they were not in a situation that he's right. In. And we talked about this last week that yeah. Casey Thompson, you, you back your starting quarterback. If you, if you think he's your starter, then you say, if his thumb is good, he'll go. Mm -hmm. Instead, last week we got Casey and Hudson are both going to play. Yeah. Hudson comes in for the, you know, Casey gets two series, uh, gets strip sacked on the first, leads a nice touchdown drive on the second. Hudson Card comes in and leads a touchdown drive as well. Mm -hmm. And then Hudson gets another series where he gets strip sacked. And then gets another series where he, they're coming off their own 19 yard line. He throws a 31 yard pick six and those two, you know, the strip sack, the interception pick six contribute to that 35, 14 halftime deficit. Casey Thompson comes out in the second half and leads six touchdown drives accounts for seven touchdowns, you know, ties Colt McCoy's school record with six touchdown passes. This is the kind of stuff that this is Steve Sarkeesian's side of the ball. Mm -hmm. And who knows what the outcome of the game is. If Casey plays the entire game, maybe it's no different. Yeah. But I, I just find it interesting at the most critical position on Steve Sarkeesian's side of the ball. You've got a guy who's completing 64% of his passes, leads the Big 12 in touchdown passes. Uh, first player in the Big 12 since Patrick Mahomes in 2016 to have multiple touchdown pass games with a rushing touchdown and is the only quarterback other than C.J. Stroud with three games with five touchdown passes. Um, and amazingly, two of those are losses. You know, he threw for five touchdowns against Tech. He threw for five against OU. He threw for six against Kansas and loses to OU and Kansas. Doesn't even get credit for those. Yeah. And and so, you know, when something like this happens where Bijan Robinson goes down for the rest of the season and you need to have a quarterback who can, you know, step up and lead, he needs to know he's the leader. 
yeah. in the eyes of the coach because you're not getting it, you know, from the offensive line. Everybody has painted that group as the worst, you know, and I don't, I still don't think they're that bad. I just think you can't have them doing as much as they're doing. But listen, Steve Sarkeesian is recruiting to a pro program and he's not going to start changing what he does in the eyes of recruits. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're trying to recruit Arch Manning, who is a pocket passer quarterback, and we'll get to this in a second, Taylor, it's kind of driving me nuts that everyone's like, these quarterbacks are terrible runners, Casey Thompson and Hudson Cart. No, Steve Sarkeesian has told them, don't run, do yeah. not run. It is the last resort. Mm -hmm. And, and so they don't run. And you look at the teams they've played. What's the common theme in every one? of the five losses they've had there are six losses yeah running quarterback KJ jefferson ran yep, 10 Arkansas. times mm -hmm. um you know gary bohannon five times for 27 yards a touchdown spencer sanders 10 carries in a touchdown caleb williams, williams four carries for 88 yards including a 66 yard touchdown jalen daniels of kansas ran 11 times for 45 yards and a touchdown and and it helps to open up your your offense helps to open up your running game but um, Steve Sarkeesian's not going to bend on that because again, he's recruiting Arch Manning, but the problem is Taylor. Now, now you've lost to Kansas. You know, the other, the other four losses in that streak, you could say, well, wow, Baylor's better than we thought. Oklahoma state looks like the, the big 12 champion. OU's the six time defending big 12 champion, but now you've lost to Kansas. Yeah. And so now it all comes right back to the coaches and what on earth, you know, now everyone's looking at Sarkeesian and he's getting questions about, have you been told you're going to have to make staff changes? And we're in, this is the one thing Texas could not afford under year one of Steve Sarkeesian, which is demand for more change. Right. He needed to get his coaching staff right so that these players in this program can grow. Now we're talking about changing out half the roster and, and maybe, you know, dropping a, a coach or two this is a complete start over when you had enough confidence and talent to get a lead uh, a double digit lead against OU Oklahoma State and Baylor and yeah. that's it's just confounding yeah, it is. And I think that the position or the side of the ball that people are expecting the changes on are the on defense, a defensive coordinator. People want there's been, you know, calls for Pete Kwiatkowski's head, you know, especially after that Kansas game. But the, you know, Chip, everyone likes it. You know, people joke that the definition of crazy is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. If Texas were to fire Pete Kwiatkowski in year one, it's literally the definite, it's already the definition of crazy because I mean, the only consistent for the up and down performances for the Texas defense dating back to um, Mac Brown being the head coach has been changed, the changing at quarter coordinator and Texas. I mean, you know, you think you look at say Josh Thompson, you know, he's out for the rest of the year, but you look at him, he has had three defensive coordinators in three years. He's had three position coaches. In three years. I mean, that is how any upperclassman on this defensive side of the ball has had three defensive coordinators, three different schemes, and the majority of the, or all of them actually have had uh, three different coaches on that side of the ball too. Position yeah. coaches. I mean, the change is the part of the problem. And I know that people want to see change for a solution. It hasn't been a solution for Texas. So if you continue down this road, well, first of all, what what defensive coordinator is going to want to come to Texas? I mean, I, I said after the game, you know, on our podcast uh, following the Kansas game, Texas is slowly becoming a place where defensive coordinators' careers go to die. And I can promise you, elite. I mean, all of these defensive coordinators that have come to Texas, they were considered elite. I mean, Tom Herman called Todd Orlando the best defensive mind in college football. Then he said the same thing about Chris Ash. Um, you know, when when Sark hired Pete Kwiatkowski, he said that he's one of the best, excuse me, best defensive minds in college football. So these coaches somehow come he to Texas and then forget to coach or forget how to coach or something. No, it's that they don't have the time to actually, you know, truly teach these players what the scheme is. And then and, and then, you know have that consistency for the players to grow within their scheme. The other thing too, Pete Kulkowski, the only hire he made was Jeff Choate. 
the, the rest, I mean, he was one of the last coaches that was hired. If you're talking about any, you know, failed hires, I think the timing of the defensive coordinator hire and hiring a defensive coordinator that did not have a chance to pick out his own assistant coaches was the big, probably the biggest quote unquote failure. If we're talking about, you know, the defensive staff in any way, and that's on, you know, Steve Sarkeesian, obviously. So if, if there's any changes, Chip, in my opinion, I feel like it needs to be Pete Kwiatkowski given the opportunity to bring in the assistant coaches that he wants, because there's never been a coach that I, or a coordinator that I have covered at Texas that I can think of at least that didn't have the opportunity to make their own assistant coach position hires, whether it's offense or defensive coordinators. And so, you know, I well, think and at the very coach, least the line coach. Yeah. Yes. You exactly. typically the offensive coordinator and the offensive line coach have to be totally in concert because of the running game and the passing game. And same with the defense, the, the defensive coordinator typically is aligned with the defensive line coach so that the front and the back of the defense are tied together. And obviously Bo Davis was one of the first coaches hired. Um, and as you said, Pete Kwiatkowski, one of the last uh, coaches hired onto Steve Sarkeesian staff. My fear Taylor is the, the culture, this, this reminds me a lot of the the culture uh, because the team was more physical and tougher last year. Now, we can say it's because of Sam Ellinger and Joseph Osai. It's because Tom Herman was a crazy-eyed drill sergeant and everybody in the locker room was in fear of Tom Herman. They played. I think they hated him. I don't necessarily think they feared him. I think they just hated okay, him. And hated they wanted him, to prove him whatever, wrong for him saying what, that they were situable. Right. But he... He had this very, you know, very tough uh, way of going about things. I mean, everything from the runny eggs and cold biscuits, if you lose in winter conditioning um, and the other, you know, the, the winners each morning got a hot breakfast, the losers got a cold breakfast. It, wh whatever you want, it's the Urban Meyer philosophy mm -hmm. and Urban Meyer is, is on the record saying fear is the greatest motivator. So. Now you have Steve Sarkeesian. It almost feels like a substitute teacher is in, in the, in the, you know, the football players are like, Hey, we got a sub today. We can kind of do whatever we want. And it feels like that's what's happening because they're not paying attention to the details. The players are trying to do too much. They're getting out of their gaps on defense. The, the culture has to be aligned from the head coach to every position coach. And I'm not sure what that culture is. I know Steve Sarkeesian's a nice guy. He's trying to treat the players with respect. And, and that's all admirable. And, and listen, the UT brass, one of the biggest reasons they got rid of Tom Herman is because they didn't think he was a quality leader of young men. They didn't like how he went about it. They didn't like how he talked to them. He didn't like how he didn't, you know, have relationships with his players and that was part of the reason they didn't think he was a quality leader of young men and got rid of him. Right. And I'm just, I'm looking around trying to find out where the edge in this program is going to come from. Where's that physical edge going to come from? This is always the concern when you hire an offensive minded head coach, because they tend to be all about the X's and O's and forget about the fact that this is a brutal physical game um some of the best cultures in football have been defensive minded head coaches i know i know it's too little too late on that but bill belichick nick saban bob stoops these are defensive minded guys who you know heck pete carroll so it just um it's it's a concern it's a concern yeah. and i'm well, not sure that even a wholesale roster change of players is going to make all the difference if that culture of of toughness and discipline isn't established by Steve, Steve Sarkeesian and then handed down by every single one of his assistants. Right. Well, and I think I think the thing that could be happening that you're seeing with Texas right now is Steve Sarkeesian's nice guy approach is being perceived by some of the players, I think some of the older players honestly, as him not being tough and that 
I think came to fruition when you think back to the Joshua Moore situation prior to him entering the transfer portal, but you know, the blow up between Steve Sarkeesian and Joshua Moore in practice that, you know, leading up to the Iowa state game, that to me, you like, it's, it's easy to, you know, speculate, I think, but at that point you have to consider with the type of head coach they had at Tom Herm with Tom Herman being the crazy eye drill sergeant, as you mentioned, the tough guy, they all, I mean, I can't tell, I I've never spoken to a player off the record that played under Tom Herman dating back to him being at Houston that actually liked him as a person. Uh, right. They said he was tough and he got a lot out of his teams, but they don't like him. Um, that most players actually despised him. And so, you know, I almost feel like going to the polar opposite of that maybe has caused some of these upperclassmen and guys that have been on the Texas roster and in the Texas football program for several years to think that, oh, he's he's nice. I, I don't have to really try as hard. I don't need to be fear the head coach because he's a nice guy. He's not the guy that's going to, you know, dog cuss me for making the mistake like Tom Herman was. And I don't necessarily think that that's how the whole locker room approaches it, but it would not surprise me, Chip, at this point, if there are some of the guys that have been, you know, the the Joshua Moores of the, you know, of Texas football who have kind of had some issues, had some off the field issues, you know, just a little bit of, um, you know, problems at times in their time at Texas, if they haven't taken Steve Sarkeesian's approach seriously, because it's so polar opposite of Texas. And that's where I think getting your own guys and guys that you're recruiting, where you from the get go can explain to them, this is how this is done. And this is how things are going to go at Texas. And if you want to come here, this is what you're going to need to expect. I think that is going to pay off tremendously so long as Steve Sarkeesian gets the opportunity to bring those guys in to actually, you know, their own guys to to learn the culture from the jump and not have to start over with a head coach that's the absolute polar opposite of what they had been become accustomed to um, in college football. Yeah. I mean, I that's got to be the hope. Yeah. Because um, this, whatever this was this year, uh, didn't work. I mean, you had veteran players uh, on the offensive line and defensive line. Um, obviously, um, you know, BJ Foster was a five star recruit in 2018. Brendan Schooler had four interceptions as a freshman safety at Oregon. Um, Jaron Thompson was a guy the, co the previous coaching staff identified as a future captain. Um, I think the cornerback position has played well this year. Mm -hmm. Josh Thompson, Deshaun Jameson, Darian Dunn, mm -hmm. uh, Jade Barron's made some plays. Um, it just, uh, it, it's just, it's confounding. Um, but the, some of the players you talk about, BJ Foster, he quit the team last year. Well, that's, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. He's, <laughs> if he's a guy that's not on in. Yeah. God bless Brennan Schooler. You know, he's been in and out of the starting lineup and then has a chance to be the hero against Kansas. Um, can't hang on to an interception in overtime that would have ended the game. It just, that's, that position just has not made plays. I know BJ Foster has three interceptions, but there's a lot of film of him not pursuing um, the run as aggressively as he should. Anyway, the bottom line is it, it just, there's, a, there's been so much slippage and then you'll see a game like the Iowa state game mm -hmm. where they play great defense for two and a half quarters. And then the offense can't come through and it, and it gives way. And that's, that's uh that's a tough one. And, and I think a lot of people were again, back to the quarterback situation. I think they watched, um, Hudson card, you know, have all those three and outs against Iowa state. He went one of 10. He's he had, he had, uh, one touchdown on 10 possessions. Those were the only points. Um, you know, that's, and then he gets, he gets three series against Kansas and you're going what, and, and, you know, is, is Steve Sarkeesian trying to muddy up the picture at quarterback so he can go get a quarterback out of the transfer portal. I mean, these are the kind of questions that you have to ask because the, the numbers don't add up. The numbers did not add up for Hudson card to get three series in the Kansas game based on what we had seen in, in games, even the previous week. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, I guess it is what it is. Um, it looks, looks to me like Steve Sarkeesian's already planning for next year. So I guess that's what we have to do. We got to yeah. just wait till next year and well, watch so here's basketball. my <laughs> Here's my thing, Chip, you know, just to kind of wrap up the quarterback talk thing. I, I don't necessarily – um, blame Steve Sarkeesian if he decides to go into the transfer portal for a quarterback because the play at quarterback, I, I know, and you know, Casey Thompson has played very well at a number, you know, in, an, in a number of games, he's played well enough in, uh, you know, the majority of his games that he has started, he has played well enough for yeah, except for Oklahoma least, State. Otherwise, but, I yeah, think he's and played, Iowa State, Iowa State too. Yeah, and he was, you know, the yes, thumb so, was a problem. Right. So there could, you know, um, three of those games, I think that he played well enough or was efficient enough is probably the best way to say it to have won the game as a starting quarterback. Mm -hmm. However, if you're, you know, Steve Sarkeesian and you are at a place that has, you know, is on this fourth head coach since 2013, if you're him, are you willing to risk potentially your future at this program on a quarterback who has started how many games has he started now um eight eight games he started and has put up pretty bad performances in two of those eight games do you want to put your career on the line for that or do you want to try to see if you can find a proven um or somebody else that might fit your style of um, offensive, you know, play that you expect from the quarterback play. I don't necessarily think that I would make that risk if I were him. I think I would probably look in the transfer portal too right now. And so you bring a good point. Is that him muddying up the the quarterback picture? Picture? I don't know. But if it is, I don't know if I would blame him if if I were in his position based off well, of he's, what he's seen so far from his quarterbacks at his disposal. He better he better nail it in the transfer portal oh, yeah. because he could lose both of these quarterbacks, right. Hudson Card and risk. Casey Thompson. Yeah. To transfer if he doesn't, you know, if they don't feel like he's being straight with them. Um, and then you're starting completely over. You know, on paper, it looked great to have, you know, Ray Thornton, Ben Davis, and Ovia Gofu coming in from national, you know, title game programs. And we haven't seen enough production from any of those three guys. You bet he better nail it if he's going into the portal to bring someone in for one year and then hoping to land, you know, Arch Manning or whatever. I just think with and again, I'm trying to stand up for a kid who's, you know, been doubted every step of the way. Oh, absolutely. Discarded, thrown away, who is, you know, put up the numbers I talked about earlier and has fought for this team. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it has put it out there and is coachable Mm -hmm. and you want a quarterback who knows the system, you know, you expect him to be better and start nine, 10, 11 and 12 than he was and starts three, four and five. Yeah. So it's just interesting Taylor, because that's, that's Sark's side of the ball. And, and I don't know. Um, Yeah. Maybe he's got, maybe he's got an ace up his sleeve. Maybe he's got someone lined up who he knows. When you were, just kidding. You know, well, you know, careful, careful what you <laughs> wish for. Um, but it uh, it's going to be fascinating. Um, that's for sure. So yeah. no we'll, uh, shortage of information that's going to be coming out of uh, Horns 24-7 in the next several months, especially with recruiting. You know, I mean, Steve Sarkeesian talking about maybe signing 33 or adding 33, you know, scholarships to the roster. Um, I don't have, let me check real quick. I was going to see how many commits they have right now. I'm pretty sure they have around 24 or 23 or something commits right now. Uh, Let me see. Hold on. Texas currently has 22 verbal commits in the 2022 class. So you're looking at 11 more guys that Steve Sarkeesian could potentially add. So you definitely want to make sure your stick over at Horns 24 seven as recruiting is going to heat up, whether it's high school recruiting, transfer portal recruiting, or elsewhere. Um, There's going to be a ton of information there. Yeah. And Taylor, you know, the good news is that it is basketball season. I know. um, Texas is a basketball school now, right? That's right. (laughs) Basketball school. Um, And just real quickly, we were, we were broadcasting our, our podcast, recording our podcast 
um, like right after the Texas Gonzaga game um, on Saturday night. So, you know, looking back on it, I, I we said going in, how was Texas going to deal with Gonzaga's size? They have, you know, Gonzaga has 6'10", Drew Timmy, 7' foot Chet Holmgren, and Texas has 6'9", Trey Mitchell, and 6'7", Christian Bishop. And then I look back and, you know, Trey Mitchell only plays six minutes in the first half when Gonzaga builds a 20 point lead, you know, poor Christian Bishop's in there trying to, to fend off Drew Timmy and, and Timmy goes for career high 37 points. It's a problem. Now they're going to get Dylan DeZoo back at some point, Dylan DeZoo, the SEC's leading rebounder at Vanderbilt last year before he suffered a knee injury, had to have off season surgery. Chris Beard has said he's going to be on the floor soon, that there was a timetable for his return that everyone agreed on. That tells me his family, his, you know, Dylan, everybody, um, they don't want to rush it. So they're going to stick to the timetable. We've seen this in the past, but it is getting closer and they need him. I mean, um, you know, I didn't get a chance to ask Chris Beard uh, yet why Trey Mitchell only played six minutes uh, in that first half when they're, you know, going down by 20. Uh, but they, you know, they, they battled, they battled mm -hmm. back in the, in the second half outscored Gonzaga in the second half. Uh, Mitchell had a hand in that. He, he played, um, I think eight minutes in the second half, but it's, um, uh, that's that you'll forgive that loss. I mean, Gonzaga's, you know, had number one season, so they <laughs> lost a Baylor in the national championship game last year. So, um, yeah, number one team in the country, too. number one team in the country. And, mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, the Texas women, Taylor, I was going to say, speaking of the beating the number one team or playing the number one team in the country, Texas women ship, my goodness, I mean, down defending national champion. Yeah. Champion. On the road. And, and Vic Schaefer, this guy is relentless. He had two freshmen in the lineup against the defending national champs who have four starters back from the national championship team. Now they did lose their point guard, but guess what? Texas was starting a freshman point guard in this game and Rory Harmon totally outplayed Sanford in this game. I mean, mm -hmm. she, you know, scored 21 points and was active defensively setting the tone and Vic Schaefer clearly has a star. And then Aliyah Matharu who transferred from Mississippi state came in off the bench and scored 17 points in this game. She's not going to be coming off the bench for very much longer. Um, but those two were huge, uh, the only two for Texas to, to score and double figures, but they were so strong defensively. I mean, they turned Stanford over 20 times, held them way below their, you know, shooting average, held them to 35% shooting and defensively, this Texas team is a monster already. And they're going to soar up the rankings, uh, based on that win on the road. And it's going to be fun to watch this team because they're they're full of really good young talent and just the right mix of veteran talent uh with Aliyah Matharu who played for Vic Schaefer at, at Mississippi State before transferring to Texas um and Vic Schaefer told us before the season Deanna Gaston would be a huge presence for this team she's she was a top 100 player you know uh in in the 20 class and then has just had injury after injury and she's playing a lot uh, and playing effectively scoring, rebounding, doing the dirty work. So uh, kudos to Vic Schaefer and that Texas women's team for going on the road, getting it done against the defending national champ. And remember Kim Mulkey has left Baylor. She's at LSU and Texas, um, you know, open the season ranked 25th, but you gotta, you gotta start looking at them as a, a possible big 12 title contender. Yeah, in Texas right now, uh, after that win over Stanford, ranks uh, number 12 by the Associated Press at 2-0. and Halfway uh, up the Baylor. rankings. Halfway up. Yeah, Stanford was, I think they were ranked two, number three and number two in uh, the polls. Now they fell to number seven after that loss to Texas. And Texas plays number fifth. Well, what is Tennessee? You looking at the rankings? Yeah, I'm looking at the rankings right now. Tennessee is, let's see here, 16. They're okay. uh, two and zero right now. So they'll play number sixteen Tennessee this weekend. 
and uh, and that'll be another good test. All right, Taylor, you ready for some love it or leave it? I am, Chip. Before we get to love it or leave it, we're going to take a really quick break, but stick around. We will return with more football talk in love it or leave it, so stay tuned. We will be right back. And if you're watching us on the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel, we will continue on here. Uh, make sure you, that you are subscribed to the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel. We, uh, as we've mentioned, are expanding our video product for Horns 24-7. We've already added the state of recruiting with Mike Roach and Nick Harris as a video podcast, also available on the Horns 24-7 YouTube page. So go on over to youtube.com forward slash Horns 24-7. Hit subscribe. It's free. We're not asking for money. We just are asking for eyeballs here. <laughs> and make sure you click the bell to get the notifications. And as always, make sure that you are uh, subscribed to and uh, following or listening to the podcast on your favorite streaming device. If you're feeling very generous, we would love for you to head on over to iTunes, give us a five-star rating and a review. And our bosses will you know, think we're doing our job pretty well. And I think we are too, Chip. What do you think? Oh yeah. You know, yeah. We're yeah. here for Especially, the people. We're here for the people. <laughs> we are. Yes. And and we get it. Texas fans right now are, you know, very little to find hope in, but basketball heating up, recruiting heating up, definitely a lot of things uh, going on right now. So make sure you tune in to all of our Horns 24 seven podcasts. Make sure you subscribe to Horns 24 seven as well. But with that said, Chip, you ready for some love it or leave it? Let's do it. All right. My first one for you is love it or leave it. The season ending injuries to B. John Robinson and Josh Thompson ensures a four and eight season for Texas. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to find the light right now. Um, you know, going to West Virginia, West Virginia has had its own problems after beating uh, Iowa state 38, 31. They got, completely shut down by Oklahoma state in a 24 to three loss. And then they were shut down for the first half against K state and dug a hole too big to climb out of um, K state ended a five game losing streak against West Virginia uh, this past week. And those are the two teams Texas has left uh, K state will come here, but K state's also on a four game winning streak and, and seems to be gaining confidence whereas uh, texas is who knows where their minds are and what's going on especially now that b john robinson and josh thompson are out for the rest of the season and and that jonathan brooks who would absolutely have been part of replacing b john robinson with roshan johnson um maybe out this week too with that shoulder injury he suffered against kansas so i'm not I'm not picking Texas to win either of these last two games. So I guess I'm going to have to love this, Taylor. How about you? Man, I I mean, insures? No, it doesn't necessarily ensure that Texas is um, going to finish four and eight. However, I'm not a betting person, but if I if I was a betting person, there's no way I would pick Texas to win either of the two remaining games. Um, you know, West Virginia and Texas are in the same boat. You know, they're both with the same record, four and six overall, two and five Big 12 play, both fighting for bowl eligibility. Um, and, you know, Texas has to go on the road there. And I don't think that playing at West Virginia is not an easy task. I mean, it's, it's probably better that Texas is playing at 11 a.m. against West Virginia instead of a night game there, because I've been to a night game in Morgantown. And I will tell you, they get rowdy like real you you don't think that you're in a stadium as small as the stadium is that's how rowdy they can get there so um but still the moonshine playing there. gets flowing <laughs> yes but still playing there you know on the road there is always you know can be a challenge too so i guess i'm gonna have to love it i don't necessarily think it ensures it however i'm also not gonna pick texas to win the next two games either so i'm gonna have to follow your suit there i think and say I love, I mean, I, I would be lying if I said, leave it. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to have to love it since I, I don't, you know, have too much faith in Texas, especially without those two. And, and Josh, I mean, everyone's talking about, you know, Bijan Robinson, obviously, but Josh Thompson, he's, he's quietly had a really good, you know, senior redshirt senior season at Texas. That's going to be a huge loss that they're going to have to replace next year with him moving on there. But, um, you know, he's been, He's been, I think, really putting together a nice season. So that's, a, I think, a bigger loss. Well, I just go back to that. It. Yeah, I go back to that series against Iowa State where Iowa State had goal to go 
Josh Thompson uh, made a tackle of Brees Hall for a three yard gain, then hurried the hurried Brock Purdy into an incompletion and then broke up mm -hmm. a pass in the end zone in three straight plays and held Iowa State to that field goal. Remember, Texas led Iowa State seven to three at halftime. Does anyone remember that? Yeah, no. Nope. Like, and just like and just like that, I mean, that's the thing. That's where I'm saying he's quietly put together a really solid season because the defense has been, you know, under scrutiny um, pretty much all year. And so, you know, there are some good players on defense. And unfortunately, Texas lost one of its best and probably most um, consistent playmakers in the secondary with Josh Thompson being out for the rest of the year. So that does not help at all. Yeah. And we've talked about how the corner cornerback play has been good enough that Texas could have crowded the line to stop the run, but yeah. that's not really Pete Kwiatkowski's style. He's more of a rush three drop eight guy. Uh, but we can talk about that <laughs> at the end of the year. All right, yeah. Taylor, how about <laughs> <Off> <laughs> love it or leave topics. it? <laughs> Love it or leave we it, number two. Going on now. All right, number two is love it or leave it. Casey Thompson deserves to be backed by Steve Sarkeesian as a team starting quarterback. Spoiler alert, I bet you Chip says yes to this. Love it. Yeah, spoiler <laughs> alert, say. yes. <laughs> love it. I mean, I, I, honestly, um, you know, unless Steve Sarkeesian has something already lined up for next year, man, you better back the guy who's had you in games. I mean, Obviously, you know, we talked about it earlier in the show. Um, you He needs to back. If he wants Casey Thompson around, mm -hmm. he needs to, you know, start talking about him like he's his starter and, and act like he's going to invest his, you know, coaching and developing him in this system uh, to – to be around. I mean, Casey's got two years of eligibility left with the COVID red shirt. Uh, and if you're getting Arch Manning, like Steve Sarkeesian is hoping, right. Uh, that dovetails nicely. And unless Malik Murphy comes in and just blows everything, you know, blows everyone away. That's a great problem to have. Right. Uh, you know, let him, let him be Caleb Williams. Um, and you know, maybe Casey Thompson, I think maybe he's Spencer Rattler. I don't know. Uh, the bottom line is you got to have consistency and something going on at quarterback or you have no chance. And Casey Thompson's shown you against OU against, you know, Baylor where receivers dropped four balls and fumbled another one against Kansas where he throws for six touchdowns, tying the school record um, that, that he can get it done. Um, and obviously, you know, I'll just say, I love it. Taylor, yeah. how about you? I mean, I'm going to say that, yeah, I'll, I'll love it, especially for this season. I mean, I don't think there's any reason uh, or any anything that Hudson Card has done up to this point that would make you not know that Casey Thompson's the starting quarterback and rightfully so should be. Um, and, you know, I think so. So, yes, I'm going to love it. I will say, let me just straight up say, yes, I love it for this year. I think that Steve Sarkeesian needs to you know, talk probably a little bit high, more highly about um, Casey Thompson, you know, especially if Texas can find a way to win these next two games and go to a bowl game. You know, I think that you, you've got to keep him engaged for sure. Um, now with saying that, it, it depends on what Steve Sarkeesian really wants the quarterback position to look like, I feel like, in year two under him. And, you know, if if there is a guy he thinks that there's potentially able to get in the portal – then I, I could understand why he's not being so openly declaring that that Casey Thompson is the guy moving forward, the starting quarterback of the future for Texas, whether he's around for another year or two years, whatever it may be. Um, if there's a guy that Steve Sarkeesian feels is a better fit for Texas that they think that they can get, then I could understand why he isn't doing it. But right now, without knowing that, without knowing who's available in the portal. Um, you know, I think that'll probably come more, that picture will become more clear, obviously, as uh, you reach the end of the regular football season uh, for this year. But yeah, I think until that actually comes to fruition, I think you have to say that Casey Thompson's the starter because the last thing is you don't want to whiff on a, if, if you're hoping to get a transfer portal, you know, addition and you don't get it and then you lose Casey Thompson, then you're stuck with Hudson Card who showed you nothing 
or a true freshman Malik Murphy who hasn't, you know, pl- played a ton of quarterback, to be honest. I mean, he, you know, he didn't, I'm pretty sure he didn't play last year, right? Because California, they right. didn't have co- the high school football. So he's a very uh, probably work in progress quarterback, and he has a very high ceiling. However, he has not showed enough to where I think if you're Steve Sarkeesian, if you don't know if uh, you can add a transfer portal, I don't think you want to enter year two with Hudson Card and true freshman Malik Murphy and Charles Wright with the, uh, you know, possibly losing Casey Thompson if you don't you know, declare him as a starter. So yeah, I'm going to love it. There's a lot, I think it's still to be determined. I think there's a lot that still has to play out with that. And I think you'll see the, you know, whatever direction the coaches will go when it comes to the end of the season. And if they are truly going to add a quarterback from the transfer portal. Well, and remember Ben Ballard right now is the third string quarterback at Texas, a (laughs) walk-on from Hyde Park high school in Austin. Um, Charles Wright, the fourth string quarterback and real quick, Taylor, I'm writing about this in tomorrow morning's morning brew. Um, Ooh, another Hudson spoiler Card alert. Has led, what's that? <laughs> another spoil, spoiler alert yeah. there. <laughs> Hudson Card has led 34 drives this season, nine of them to points. Uh, that's 26.5%. Uh, Casey Thompson has led 90 drives, 49 of them to points, uh, which is 54%. In the losses, okay? Um, Hudson card has led 24 drives in, um, the losses that he participated in, uh, and led them to points on three of those. So 12.5%, uh, Casey Thompson in his, well, I'm not even going to count the Arkansas game where he led two touchdown drives out of two drives, just in the five game losing streak. He's, you know, led them to points on 23 of 58 drives, which is 39.7%. So, you know, that's higher than Hudson cards, you know, percentage on the drives that he led in all the, you know, on all the drives he's led. So it's, it is what it is, but, um, I mean, and Arkansas was a little, that, that was a tough team. I mean, Arkansas is not some, cupcake loss too so I, I mean I, I'm curious for just randomly do you think that the outcome of the Arkansas game would have ended with a win if Casey Thompson had started or win? do you think yeah or do you think they still would have lost but just had more points it, you know I it would have been a close game yeah it would have been a battle because I remember it was only 16 nothing at halftime and they had you know Dicker dropped that snap at like the 14 and you know Arkansas was getting they got up on them uh, mm-hmm. but Texas held them to field goals. Um, yeah, which they've done so, a lot in games. You know, I just Kansas. think I, you know, this because we did the flagship all summer. I said, you know, the makes sense to start Casey mm-hmm. just for that Arkansas game, you know, start him against Louisiana. And Hudson Card played well against yeah. Louisiana. He did. He did. Um, yeah, he could. He, man, he had three third down completions of, you know, third and seven or longer. And we talked about how they couldn't live like that, but uh, most of those, by the way, to Jordan Whittington, but um, you know, it, it just, uh, it is what it is. And, you know, we'll see. And, and we also have to factor in that the receiving core has disappeared as (laughs) Casey's gone through this uh, losing streak. So it's, you know, He's he's yeah. over. He hasn't complained about a thing, and he's he's battled. I'll, I'll give him credit for that. Oh, All right, love it or leave yeah. it, number three. All right, my final one for you is love it or leave it. Texas getting outscored forty-four to twenty-two points in the paint by Gonzaga is cause for alarm. Um, uh, I, I won't say cause for alarm because I don't think there are many teams that can match Gonzaga. In terms of their paint presence, you know, Drew Timmy, Chet Holmgren, these are two of the best players uh, in college basketball, period. Chet Holmgren could be the number one pick in the NBA draft next spring. So not cause for alarm. I think it's a wake up and it it shows how much this team is going to welcome Dylan DeZue, the six foot nine Vanderbilt transfer who led the SEC in rebounding last year onto the floor. Um, and I would like to see Trey Mitchell, um, 
in the paint. I know he's much more offensively skilled than he is a defensive presence in the paint, but he is six, nine and he's long, um, you know, but I, I'll leave this as cause for alarm, but I will say this Taylor, Oklahoma and Kansas both have size, um, mm-hmm. down low. And so Kansas obviously is the one team picked ahead of Texas in the big 12, um, preseason. So, uh, but I won't say cause for alarm at this point. Let's see what Texas looks like with Dylan to in the paint. How about you? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to agree. I'm going to love it. I mean, this isn't, it's not like they lost to Kansas football or something like that. I mean, it's, they lost to Gonzaga, you know, I mean, this is the number one team in the country. Right. Um, this is not, you know, some game that they sh- should have just, you know, handled it and they didn't do that or something like that. It's a, you know, it's a totally different uh, situation. Um, and, you know, as, as you mentioned, getting mentioned, you know, getting, uh, Dylan Zubak is going to be big for Texas basketball too. So hopefully that's sooner rather than later if you're a Texas basketball fan. But yeah, I think saying it's cause for alarm after, I mean, how many games have they played now? Two, two, three, two. Yeah. The exhibition thing. Yeah. So two games. I mean, it's way too early to sound any alarms, I think. And especially in year one and plus Chris Beard's proven time and again, why he got this job as the Texas head coach. I mean, honestly, so um, yeah, I don't think there's any reason to doubt him or doubt this uh, roster that he's put together, which I think is a really, really talented roster from top to bottom for Texas basketball and, and a much needed overhaul of Texas basketball. We'll say that. <laughs> well, and as Tom Penders, I'll, I'll quote him again. As Tom <laughs> Penders always used to tell me, if football's having a bad season, basketball better have a good season. No pressure, Chris Beard there. <laughs> no pressure. Rick Schaefer's already, <laughs> already living up to his – his billing, he took a, a a thin group of six players to the Elite Eight last year. Yeah. And and he's off and running, taking down the defending national champ, Stanford, uh, already this season. So exciting stuff. Get over to horns247.com to keep up with all of it. And make sure you subscribe to the Horns247 YouTube channel. And make sure that you check out our interview preview podcast with Mike Casaza of the uh, of our West Virginia twenty four seven site, which we will uh, will drop on Thursday for you. So for Taylor Estes, I am Chip Brown. We'll see you at over at horns twenty four seven dot com. Until then, stay safe and keep the faith. <laughs>